welcome to the West Jordan Planning Commission meeting for June 16th, 2017. 15. Wow, sorry. Uh, we have six members of the commission present. Uh, Commissioner Sikoski is absent this evening. Uh, looking at our, we have one item on our consent calendar tonight, which is the minutes from our last meeting, June 2nd, 2015. Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Jacobs, second by Commissioner Green. Any discussion to the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Uh, our first public hearing tonight is the Salt Lake County Health Department, 7971 South, 1825 West. Uh, application for a conditional use permit for a building height of 38 feet in a PF zone. MHTN Architects, Great Teachers, the applicant. Is the applicant present? The time is now yours. We were here last month for our um, preliminary site plan uh, approval, and we're here just to talk about our conditional use to actually allow us to be a little bit higher than what you would normally have. We feel like we're here part of the campus and, and we're in, um, kind of in sync with the rest of the buildings here in this area. It will allow us to have a, a nice entry for the public and also help to screen our mechanical systems. And so that's what we're here asking for. Any questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Larson. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I think the applicant covered uh, essentially why it's coming back to Planning Commission. Um, it's due to the requirement that a building height over 30 feet requires a conditional use. As part of the conditional use, uh, staff is also included. Uh, two other conditions uh, which are specific to the site plan on the property. One, that a four foot wrought iron, wrought iron fence along an east property line uh, to separate the two uses, uh, the new use from the fire station 53 and wayfinding signs along Redwood Road and 18, uh, 8020 South to be installed. Any questions for staff? Will, will that uh, fence run the full length of that east border? It would on the east side of the property where uh, the parking lot is. It would run that entire east uh, border. Okay, good. Any other questions for staff? Commissioner Jacobs? Uh, just one quick question. That just made me look at this east border one more time. That, that, that little, call it the Utah shape cut out there, is there a, an additional driveway or what is, what is the purpose of that? It's hard to see it on the pictures. Are you talking about where the, there's that cut out yeah, portion? Bottom, bottom right of that last slide. Yeah. On, on the lot, not on the building. Yeah. So that's just the um, property line is that's where that. The property line just has a dog to it, so the fence would have a dog to it as well. There's there's no there's no driveway from the fire station into this parking lot. Okay. No, there's not. Mr. Jacob, what that is is a generator and a couple of sheds, and it's a brick wall that okay. that is part of that cutout. So I assume that the fence will come and just butt into the to the block wall there. Excellent, thank you, Chief. Very well. Uh, open this meeting to the public. If there's anybody who would like to comment on this particular item, the time is now yours. We would invite you to the microphone. If you would please give us your name and contact information for the public record. And you will have three minutes to make your comments. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for any further discussion. Commissioner Green. I'll make the motion to approve the conditional use permit uh, based on the positive findings set forth in the staff report and the information that we received tonight. I move that the planning commission approve the Salt Lake County Health Facility Height Conditional 
for the Salt Lake County Facility Conditional Use Permit for the property located at 7971 South, 1825 West in the PF Zoning with conditions 1 through 6 as listed in the staff report, our page 5. Motion by Commissioner Green, second by Commissioner Clean. Any discussion? Commissioner Jacobs. No, thank you. Comment, I was going to just bring up. I just wonder on the, and this is just throwing this out for discussion if anything, if nothing else, if the fence on the east property line should be a condition of approval for the building height. They seem completely unrelated to me. It seems to me more that that should have been a condition on the site plan or on the development plan and not necessarily as a conditional use for the building height. So I'm just tossing that out there as I don't see how it's related. Except for, oh look, we want to have a fence here. And while we're applying for something here, let's throw this in. But it's not a condition. I think you have a valid point there. That's my only, everything else seems to make sense. I don't think we should hold it up necessarily for this. I just don't see how it makes sense. When we review a conditional use, it's for the entire site. It's not necessarily particular to the building height. So we can include other conditions that are relevant to the site since the building height is really related to the overall layout of the site. But if they would have, so the question is though, just for my edification, is if they had come in at the 30 feet that was within the code and not had a conditional use permit, we couldn't have required the wrought iron fence at this point? At this time, no. We could have during the preliminary site plan review. Okay. That's all. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6 to 0. The next item on our agenda is Davis Assisted Living Quarters, 3226 Starlight Drive. Application for a conditional use permit for accessory living quarters in an R1C, RR1C zone. Sammy Davis is the applicant. Is the applicant present? The time is now yours. Yes, we're just trying to make accessory living quarters on a, it's a center block building that we have on our property that's been there for probably close to 30 years. And the reason why we're trying to do that is we're, we've met all the requirements in order to be able to, we're following all the guidelines in order to be able to do the accessory living quarters. But we're kind of doing it because my mother is not able to get up and down our stairs. We've got a split entry and stairs going everywhere. And so we were trying to get her on ground level because she's got a mobile card and my wife now stays at home and it helps with her. And so, and she also has other people that come in and also help. So we've been trying to get her so she can be more mobile, make it a little bit better for her. And that's kind of the reason why we're asking for the accessory living permit. We've kept it under the square footage guidelines and everything that we needed to meet. And so it's just a matter of whether or not we can get approval for a permit. So there was some discussion in our pre-meeting that the RR1 zone is no longer a zone that's codified here in our city. So staff is recommending an additional condition to the ones currently listed that this would be contingent on city council approving us allowing the RR1 zone to be reviewed as an RR40 zone. Is that? Yeah, and they told me that today. So I just found out about that today. So did we. So, yeah. Very well. We thought we were clear on everything and we found that one out. So that was kind of a new thing. I guess it needs to be added into the in-house order. We were fortunate that Commissioner Green did his homework on this one and found something that needed to be cleaned up here. Any questions for the applicant? I've got a couple. Commissioner Green. The entrance to this, are you going to use the existing door? No, it's going to have a 
the door cannot be accessible to the uh, to the road. So we're actually uh, there's a small addition that actually turns the door, so it's facing east and won't be able to be seen from the road. That was one of the qual one of the things that you had to one of the qualifications to to make it work. And we put that on the plans, so it's on the plans that we had brought up. Second question, I didn't see on the site plan where the paved uh, parking spot's going to be. And we still have to put that paved parking spot on. Okay. That's part of what we have to do with I mean, it's, uh, and it talks about today. So my, my biggest question, and this will be the, this will probably be the one that puts you on the spot the most, is that according to the letter of intent you submitted, it shows the house as being 2575 in square feet. Yeah. Yes. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, your house is a you, you got one floor above above ground level and one below, correct? Correct. The county assessor's report shows that your house is only about 1,920 square feet, 960 on each one, but it's 40 by 24. And your site plan to scale shows that about uh, that amount. So how how do we get from uh, a 40 by 24 house? To a 25, 75 square. They also house. allowed me to use the uh, carport that we have uh, as part of the square footage in order to make the 800 square feet, 850 okay. square feet, as the 33 percent that they're allowed to have. Okay. And the last question that I have: Do you have any idea what kind of material you're going to put on the outside of that cinder block? To yeah, we want to stucco it. Uh, is what we decided would be the best thing to do uh, uh, and it's something that we can do so we decided that that would be the best route is to do stucco. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? We'll save you some time after the public hearing if there is anything you'd like to address from that comment period. Okay, thank you. Ms. Larson. Thank you, Commissioner. Staff has found during the review of this project uh, that the Davis Accessory Living Quarters meets all of the requirements uh, listed in the uh, zoning ordinance to have accessory living quarters. And with that additional condition, um, so it would be 13 conditions, staff is recommending uh, Planning Commission approve uh, the Staff is recommending uh, that Planning Commission approve the conditional use. Is that a common practice to include parking space and square footage? Yeah, that was going to be my question. The carport. My garage is not typically included in my, my county assessed square footage. In this case, it's just the total square footage of the, of the home. It's the footprint. As it reads in the conditions, 33% of the gross floor area. And floor, to me, floor area doesn't mean carport. I, I would concur on that one. Uh, Mr. David. Uh, I was waiting for the answer. <laughs> that was actually kind of interesting. Can you tell me uh, um, where the, which section of the code sets out these conditions for accessory living quarters? I was just trying to find it, and I find the one for the conditional use permit, but not, that's the more general conditional use permits. Zach, it's 13817. 13817, thank you, sir. I just happen to have that in front of me, just part of the number. I had a question on another part of it, but I wanted to look at the code first, so thank you. Commissioner Pat? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Did, uh, Ms. Larson, is there any difference between a mother-in-law that is connected to an existing dwelling versus one that's detached? Code. For instance, this one has a, a cinder block home. Um, I'm just curious, I haven't seen anything in 13817. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? My, my, the mother in laws that I'm familiar with are hooked to an already existing home and they're just making another addition for the, for the mother in law. But is there any different requirement for one that's a separate structure? This one is specific to a, se a separate structure, it's an accessory. An accessory use. So it was a mother in law apartment, it was a mother in law apartment, <coughs> apartment. It was attached to the house, it was just a part of the house. Right, okay. 
so that the requirements. So these are a specific set of requirements for detached. For a detached that, right. separate. Thank you. Right. That, that was a clarification I was inquiring about. Thank you. My, my question, while he's still looking up the, the, the code, is do the requirements of 13.5b.6 with the brick and stone requirement fall in uh, for the homes? Does that fall on an accessory uh, building as well in this, in, with, this, with this kind of building? And what? Third, you know, where we have, you have the perimeter multiplied by, you know, whatever. Does that, does that, is that a requirement on this building or a stuff, or is that something that I know that that, that ordinance talks about, uh, the staff can look at that, determine what's appropriate. But I'm just wondering if 13.5b.6 doesn't apply to this particular, uh, to this structure as well. The requirements for an accessory living quarter, um, all that the code relates to uh, accessory living quarters is architecturally compatible with the principal dwelling. Okay, so, um, so, so it is subject to interpretation and uh, we were planning on reviewing it during a building permit review uh, and requiring a material board, um, but that is subject to something the planning commission could discuss. Okay. I, I, I'm just, well, I'm just concerned that as, as I look at the neighborhood, at least from the area of photos, most of these homes are brick. And to, to you know, stucco is not bad. My house is half stucco, and so, you know, I, I get it, or part stucco. I'm just wondering if some, if brick, some brick isn't appropriate. If I remember right, this house from a picture I saw, it's got some stonework on it. So it may be something we need to take a look at. Any other questions for staff? Very well. No? Okay. Uh, we did have a couple of individuals who signed up in advance to speak on this particular item. Uh, first was Daryl Packer. Public hearing open. <laughs> Good, sir. Uh, I've got some concerns with it. Uh, one, it's an apartment on a single family <coughs> residential or you know rural residential area. Uh, it's for a mother-in-law, and then I heard it was for uh, for the kids. I heard two different do different things <clears throat> on that. My concern would be, <clears throat> is it going to stop it? What after the mother? Who's going to be in it next? Uh, we've had a lot of crime stuff on the place. Uh, I don't want to invite any more than what we have. Uh, zoning, I do not want to change our zoning. Uh, is a, a major concern that could, in the future, uh, come up as a zone change. What's it going to do to the property value of having something like that in there? Is it going to affect our property value? Taxes, uh, you know, changing our zoning is huge. I understand and I, I like to help people out as well. Uh, we've done it before in the past too, but it's always, this is a permanent structure. Uh, we've had to do it, but as soon as we had the trailer was done, it had to be off the property. Uh, but this is a, a permanent uh, build. And where, where does it stop? I, I, my concern is even thereafter. Uh, is this going to change our zoning? I, the zoning issue was actually independent of the application. It was just something that was found uh, while it was being reviewed. So is, is it something that is a possibility to change that's going to change our zoning of what we have? That would be up to City Council. Uh, and if that is agendized, that will be noticed as well. And we'll give you an opportunity to speak on that. 
the zoning issue this evening is not a, a rezoning. It's a the city renamed this zone. It's the same zone. They just gave it a new name 13 years ago and forgot to update the map. Okay. That's, that's the only zoning issue here tonight. Okay. Well, I know I'm sure my time's up. I, I just have a few issues I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next individual who signed up, I believe it's Kent. Is it Merton? Some concerns, same as Darrell. I live in the house, two down to the right. That's my shop there. We built that shop five, six years ago. Uh, at the time of building that shop, I wanted to just put a bathroom in there for, you know, so I could wash up or do whatever before I go in the house. I was told absolutely not because West Jordan couldn't protect me or stop me from making that into a park. I said, okay, no bathroom in the shop. Now, you guys are thinking about allowing a full family to live in a shop where five years ago I couldn't do it. Okay? We've had, like Darrell said, multiple crimes on the street. Our whole street was robbed Thanksgiving Day. We don't want to invite people. Sam has had people living in that camp trailer right there. Just a young couple with in the campground, they skirted up, they tied into the, uh, the plumbing, did that illegal, no permit. There's, there's a, a septic tank that they put, a plastic septic tank they put in there. Who's going to say that it's going to stop with these mother this, this ain't right. You're not going to be able to control me, and in six weeks after it's built, he can do whatever he wants. Who's going to police this? Do I have to call West Jordan and say, hey, there's new people in there. Go see if they're relatives. Because I don't trust this guy. He's proven to me time and time again. He, he does all this building on the place with no permit. Why is he better than anybody else? He's not. And I feel like he's just going to take more advantage and more advantage and more advantage. You guys allow this to happen, it's not going to stop. I'll bet you... Because that trailer's still skirted, still hooked up to the sewer. I'll bet you within two years there's somebody staying in that. Maybe not on a permanent basis, but every once in a while. There's a, that place is full of people all the time, in and out, cops there all the time. I don't want to invite any more to my street than as absolutely necessary. And I disapprove of this. If it changes their zoning, I don't want that. I, I think you need to play by the rules like everybody else in the city and pay his dues like we have to. So that's what I've got to say. This I am um, very good friends with the lady who was in here. What was her name again? Kim Merton. And Christy Henshaw is the one that lives right next to Sam. So she's between <laughs> us and Sam. And I'm over there a lot. And between her house and our shop, front view windows. So for the last year and a half, witness, I witnessed it a lot. And what he is claiming a mother-in-law apartment as his claim is totally 100% not true. There's been people in and out of that trailer. There's been dogs, a ton of dogs. People in and out constantly. Of that building, living in that building. And everything that they, well not everything, they have built, they go out there after dark so people can't see try to talk to them uh, at times. Um, there is a little tiny black chihuahua dog of somebody that's staying there right now that's constantly running the street. It does matter because it's part of the people that they've invited in on this individual resident's house that is supposed to be in the house. So it's the kind of people that are in there right now. And this is just another type that is being invited into our residence. So I think the rezoning of this, and, and you know, I had my father in law there. I had to take care of him. We were there. Lived in our house. Lived in our house. 
we had to accommodate our house. And not only that, his, his Sir, house. Sir, we can only really have one person speaking at a time. You had your opportunity to speak. Yeah. I just believe that there needs to be more review in what was put on the table because it's not 100% accurate. Thank you. I just have one more. You, you had your opportunity. We only allow silly comments one at a time. Is there anybody else who would like to comment on this particular item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and I invite the applicant up if you would like to address any of the specific concerns that were raised. Uh, you are correct. Um, I didn't get a permit for closing my uh, hay barn in. That's kind of what kind of got this all started. Um, but as far as, uh, and so I went down to get a permit and we've been, been trying to do the due diligence. That's why I came to the city council to try to see if I could actually do this. And when I talked to uh, Mr. Bailey had told me that, uh, uh, yes, in your rural area, there is, uh, the rules, rules do state as long as you do these set of rules, you're okay to uh, have an accessory living quarters. And we've done a deed restriction where you can't have uh, anybody but blood relatives in there. We did, and that's also why we got in trouble. Somebody was living in our trailer. We didn't have a person living there was a family member, uh, my wife's, her wife, my wife's um, uh, sister who has got MS, is uh, terminally ill in a hospital, asked us to help this gentleman out. Uh, it was almost a godsend when we got him to go because uh, I couldn't get him to, you know, get a job, do the things that he should do to be a, a real citizen. He would have a job and then he would be out of the job. He was supposed to only be there for three months. He wound up being there for over a year. And uh, uh, so, but we didn't understand that we weren't allowed to have somebody living in there uh, at the time. Uh, so, but now I know I can't do that. You can only have somebody who can only stay in there for no more than two weeks. Uh, so we, uh, so they haven't been there now since March. Uh, and, uh, but as far as us building and doing those type of things, that's absolutely incorrect. We haven't done anything like that of the sort, except for when I tried to uh, enclose my hay barn because it was, you know, it's, we've actually used it as storage is all it's used for. And with that storage, uh, the birds are just so bad that they were just uh, ruining everything. Uh, so I enclosed the barn not knowing that I couldn't do that. And, uh, but as soon as I found out I couldn't, I went right straight to, uh, the day after I found out, I went to uh, talk to Mr. Bailey and got a permit and we're doing everything to that to make sure that we comply with, uh, uh, with the permit. There's a few things they asked us to do, which we're getting completed. Um, and, uh, and then I, I talked to him about the accessory living at that point. And that's when he had told me that, uh, uh, had looked it up and said, yes, you're, according to your, uh, where you guys are at, you, if, as long as you meet all these requirements, you could actually do that. So, uh, and I know I have, so I've had people at my house that uh, probably wasn't uh, the best people to have at the house at the time. Uh, but again, you know, it's one of those guys, I am always trying to help everybody. That's why my mom is living with me and not the, the other six kids that we have. Uh, but uh, at this point, that's uh, why we're trying to get this uh, done. We understand that there's not allowed to be a, uh, a nobody but a blood relatives. We're not trying to downplay the, uh, everybody's property values. Uh, I think it's actually going to improve it. That darn barn has looked like that for so long that it'll be nice to actually get an improvement to, to make it uh, you know, look more like the house. Uh, I haven't really had the money to do that. so. We slowly have been trying to get the place fixed up. We've been working on it for the 10 years that I've been there and constantly trying to improve everything we can. I'm I really am sorry that my neighbors are feeling like it's going to uh, uh, hurt the property values, but the police and stuff that's been at my house is because uh, uh, my mom has been in and out of the hospital for the last two years and we've had fire departments there, we've had the police there, we've had everybody at my house. Um, along with I've got, we had the theft at my house as well as everybody else on the block. 
three cars got broken into the same time everybody else did in Thanksgiving. So I didn't get anything different than anybody else that's living there. And so I hope that you guys will still give me a chance to improve our living quarters. Thank you. Further discussion, questions? Amongst us. Commissioner Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's tough because you see he says, she says, and without going to the residents to verify the medical condition of the mother or, you know, checking things out on a daily basis, I see that this is a quasi-judicial item, which means that it requires findings of facts to reach the conclusion of a law to justify the decision. So although we can have discussion and the tugs at our cars are mine, wanting to be the city of the good neighbor, wanting to help out mom, or the neighbors saying this isn't really going to be for that intended use, to me that would be quasi-legislative as opposed to quasi-judicial. The way that I've seen it is if the applicant has met all of the criteria that our code mandates, that there really wouldn't be a legislative reason for us to deny since it's a judicial action. This is my understanding. If I'm understanding the application correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, I agree with much of what Commissioner Pack has just said. The issues raised by the neighbors, which are not to be discounted, you have legitimate concerns, are not specific to this application. This application is for a conditional use permit for an accessory living structure, or accessory living quarters. If there is illegal activity going on, police need to be called. If there's code enforcement issues, code enforcement needs to be called. And our city mayor may not do a good job of responding to that, and I apologize if they stink at it. You know, city council meets next Wednesday night, come talk to them, the police chief will be sitting right there, and they'll be happy to hear that argument. But for this application, for this conditional use, it's a code that is set out that says this condition, this condition, this condition has to be met. Our staff has reviewed it and says they have been met. I've reviewed it and it looks to me like they've been met, with the possible exception of the square footage of the house and how that's calculated. So, whereas I sympathize with your concerns, it's just not the right spot to do something about it. Commissioner Green? First off, I want to thank all the neighborhood for being here and testifying in the public hearing. I want to give you my perspective, is that what we do have to do is find whether or not this particular thing meets the code. And any decision that I make will be based on the legal requirements of the code and not necessarily something else. And we have to find the facts. And so, I want you to understand where we're coming from is that we do have to find facts in a judicial manner and we do have to balance the code. That being said, I am going to say that I believe the criteria too, based on some of the testimony of the neighbors, where it talks about the proposed use will have an adverse effect on the property, adjacent property, or the surrounding neighborhood for the whole. Well, that means that there has to be some testimony from the neighbors that there has been some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony from the neighbors that there has been some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and criteria too. Maybe there's some testimony to that and cri
850 actually exceeds the 33%, so it couldn't meet the requirement of the code because if we did 2575, it's 849.75, and to meet the exact requirement of the code to not exceed 33%, square footage would have to be smaller. If, for hypothetical sake, we stretch the carport, we're only talking about 2400 square feet, not 2575, and that backs the structure back to 792. If we go with the 1920 that the county assessor has with the square footage, which is actually the floor space, we're talking about a structure of 633. I'm confused, but at this point, I think that based on the my plain meaning of the code, I think that the 33% has to be the living space, the floor space, not including structures, carport. It's the floor area, the principal dwelling unit. Carport is not a principal dwelling unit as far as I'm concerned. So I see that I have it with a hard time. The other one that I have a hard time with is the condition written in the report that requires a deed restriction indicating the restricted, or there's one of the conditions, as we talk about recommended conditions of approval, it talks about the deed on restriction has to ensure only family members related by blood marriage and adoption are occupying the site. There's an affidavit for that, but I believe reading the stat, reading the ordinance, that the restriction, so if we do start talking about this, I think we need to modify the condition. The restrictions on the property not only include renting these to blood relatives or immediate family members, no home-based business, maintain the parking spot. There's a bunch of those because this is a covenant that runs with the land. And at some point in time, somebody else comes and buys it, and they don't understand the covenants that run with the land. They rip up the parking spot, put in a garden. They put a home-based business in there. We've got to, so if we get to the point where we approve that, number eight, condition number eight has got to be fixed at least. Those are my concerns, and I'll shut up for a minute. Not any longer. Thank you. One of the conditions requires a parking spot for this accessory structure. Was there a plan to make that a carport? Was that discussion at all, or just a slab and a place to put a car? It would just be a paved parking spot designated for the accessory living space. Any other comments, questions, concerns? And just to address the square footage issue, while I was reviewing it, I did take the applicant's square footage of the single-family house, which Greg Mikolaj was the zoning administrator at the time, and he made a determination that the garage would be included as part of that square footage of the single-family house, the principal dwelling. And initially this confused me as well, but after speaking with the applicant, the dimensions of the accessory structure are different than what you see on an aerial. If you measure it on the aerial, then it does exceed the 33% of the principal dwelling. When you look at the floor plan and you take the measurements of the floor plan, then it does meet the square footage of the principal dwelling at 33%. The reason being is the accessory structure, the accessory living quarters won't take up the entire structure, the entire accessory structure. But if you look at the site plan that's drawn on page 11 of the packet, it shows 40 feet, 27 feet, something, and that's consistent. And the back half is storage, and the front is, and the building is 28 feet wide, and we've got 40 feet going. That's a whole lot longer than, you know, I guess if we talk about bringing that one wall way back, the storage is just going to get bigger. But I have heartburn saying that we can use the carport as a living space, and I don't think that's what the code requires. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Case is submitted. Counsel are excused.
carport that's only 480 square feet to less than 1920 that the county assessor is 2,400 square feet. I still don't see, unless we attach the part of the building that's the deck and the other part of the building, the basement entrance and everything to take the total footprint that Mr. McCann was talking about, I don't see how we get to 2,500 square feet. But to be honest with you, when I look at this, I look at the intent is that the square footage of the apartment, if you will, shouldn't be more than 33% of the living space. I mean, the living space that's in the apartment shouldn't exceed more than 30. It doesn't say footprint. It says gross floor space. And everything, you know, yeah, I get assessed for a car. I get assessed for a garage. But my garage, when I sell my house, doesn't count as square footage for the house. And so I have, I actually have some heartburn with the interpretation there on the square footage to say, no, it's the footprint because it's really, to me, the intent of the, to me, the intent is to say the building. And this is the conflict. This is also the conflict I have with this particular, with this particular application is we're taking an existing building that was unpermitted. And now we're permitting part of the construction. And if we were to throw that building off the property and put it in, the footprint on that building would be only half the size. Be a quarter, you know, a third of the size of that building. And it would meet the characteristics of the neighborhood. Now what we're doing as a commission is condoning an unpermitted building and saying that footprint's okay because you only use part of it and use the rest of it for storage. And I have a philosophical disagreement with doing that in that, in that, in this particular perspective. I think the intent of the ordinance is to put a building on it and say it's this size compared to your house. This one is not this size compared to your house. It's a whole lot bigger. It was unpermitted. And now we're trying to go back and say it's okay. And I have some serious heartburn with that. So that, that's, you know, that's me. That's, that's just me because we're trying to take a non-conforming use and using part of it for a conforming use. But what do we do with the other part of that that is a non-conforming use? Because what we're doing now is condoning using that storage space that's an attack that by code has to be larger than 200 square feet, has to be building permitted and everything. We're condoning, we as a planning commission are condoning an illegal building. And I disagree with that. And, and, and so given, given those facts, I can tell you that I'll be voting against this proposition. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Larson, you referenced a floor plan. Do we have a floor plan in evidence? There's not one in the packet other than this hand-drawn map. I do have a copy of the floor plan here. I didn't include it as an exhibit in the staff report. Okay. What's the square footage shown on the floor plan of the, of the residence, the accessory residence? So this is the floor plan here. So this is, yeah, 40 feet by 20 feet. Minus this, there's a 13 by 11 storage room. So if we don't include that, that's a, what, 143 square feet to subtract from the 1120. So it still gives you just under 1,000 square feet. If you count the laundry room. Pass this down if anybody wants to look at it. But it's basically, it's the 40 by 28 foot as shown. But it does have an 11 by 13 storage room and a laundry room in the back, which I think would count because my laundry room counts. Am I supposed to be it? I agree. So even if we don't include the storage room here and the storage, I guess it's on the back of this, it's not shown on the floor plan. It still comes up to just under 1,000 square feet. Why would we discount the storage space? The code says gross floor area. I'm just, even for the benefit of the doubt, I'm just throwing that out there because storage may be separate from living quarters. 
Uh, as far as the, the accessory liver, not the house, the accessory liver. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just tossing out there because that building is going to be split into storage and living quarters. I was including that in the storage. Again, just for the benefit of the doubt, but it's still too big. So, by this floor plan. So this floor plan is not in evidence necessarily or in uh, the application. So I am going to point out that 13817 does allow this, does allow us to deny this if the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of both conditional use cannot be mitigated by the proposal or the imposition of reasonable conditions to achieve the compliance with applicable standards, the conditional use shall be denied. Uh, from my perspective, the proposed conditional use cannot substantially mitigate the already improper building on this property. And I think that given the code, this is my, my position to advocate is that I think that given the, given the non-conforming piece of property and, 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 and making part of it conforming and saying part of it's not, I think we're just creating a, a mess that I think we have to deny this. That's, that's where I think we go. So if you don't mind, I am going to make a motion that this planning commission deny this particular uh, conditional use permit based on the fact that the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of the proposed conditional use cannot be mitigated by the proposal and that reasonable conditions to achieve the compliance with the applicable standards cannot be met. Second. Motion by Commissioner Green, second by Commissioner Watts. Discussion to the motion. Commissioner Baker. Thank you. Um, when I first reviewed this, I just want to put this out there. I thought the code was too restrictive. I thought if you want to have a mother-in-law apartment that's as big as your house, you should have a mother-in-law apartment that's as big as your house. I don't. You know, mother-in-law. My mother-in-law should have a nice place to live. Darn it! Hope that's on record for my wife. Uh, you know, I, do, I I think it's kind of silly. And and if you want to rent necessarily a, a mother-in-law apartment out to somebody who's not your mother-in-law, that should probably be okay too in my book. However, I don't get to make the laws in this body. Uh, this body doesn't get to make code or tell whether or not the code is good or bad. We only get to decide if the code is met. In this case, I think it was Commissioner Green mentioned, I don't think it is. Any further discussion? The question I have is, is what could the applicant do to meet that? Tear half the building down? Would that be an option to, to meet the the minimum square foot or the maximum square footage? I guess that's always an option. <laughs> Putting the building on his house. <laughs> that's exactly right. I, I, I think there's an option there. You get out the addition to the house. Right. That, would, that would have to be a separate application. Oh, yeah, that's exactly that. right. So, yeah. I don't think we could add conditions to this conditional use permit application that we're not no. then because this is specific to an accessory structure. Right. Commissioner? So in other words, the applicant is asking for forgiveness rather than permission because he's already built the building and illegally basically. So that being said, I, I have to agree with Commissioner Green if that's if that's the, the situation. Well, I think the use of the building is also changing entirely right. from storage to a living structure. That part of the building will still be used for storage, and we're condoning we're we're condoning any the structure at least half the structure that's non-conforming. So. You know, that's like I said. That's my opinion, and we'll, we'll, you know. Should the building have been built in the beginning without permission? Uh, I that's, think that's where that's you kind of for to you. our discussion this evening. Yeah. Yeah. 
Any further discussion? Uh, so our motion at the moment is to deny this based on the reasons stated by Commissioner Green. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. The next item on our agenda is Jordan Landing Phase 7, 7556 South Campus View Drive, uh, looking at a general plan land use amendment for approximately 8.8 .8 acres, from very high density residential to regional commercial and SC3 zone, uh, four square properties, and no LCC applicants. The time is not yours, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the Commission, my name is Dan Millich. I'm Development Director for Four Square Properties. Four Square Properties is the developer of Jordan Landing. Um, started in the early 90s and is continuing to this day to be built out. That's really the purpose of being here this evening. We attended a pre-application meeting with planning staff and other city development departments in March of this year. We talked to them specifically about this uh, parcel and the future development of this parcel, as well as some other open space or undeveloped parcels within Jordan Landing and how we would ultimately build those out. As Director of Development and Four Square, my duty to make sure that that happens over time is part of my job duties. So this parcel um, had at one time a 120-unit apartment project and a gas station approved on it um, under the very high density uh, land use designation for this site. What our goal is uh, for this property is to build it out in a commercial fashion similar to the surrounding Jordan Landing commercial development. And because of that, we're here this evening to request that the general plan designation be changed to be consistent with the underlying zoning, the regional commercial zoning designation. And we would uh, like to change the general plan designation to regional commercial as well to mirror the underlying zoning. And then our goal is to move forward, bring in development development proposals to you to further the development of this site as a commercial development site. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we have uh, met with staff and, and submitted a site development permit application that shows the further subdivision of that parcel into six parcels and shows potential uses on those six parcels that are uh, consistent with the underlying zoning designation and the soon to be hopefully underlying land use designation. Thank you. Any questions for your applicants? Thank you. Thanks. I think the applicant did a great job. Uh, and the, uh, again, the request is just to change the future land, the designation on the future land use map to be consistent with everything that's around it. We think it makes sense. Uh, this is just a copy of the of the general plan showing that designation on the property. So our recommendation is is for approval to go ahead and proceed. We'll, the site plan will come back before the and the subdivision will be coming back before the planning commission, so we can take a good close look at the the uses that they have in mind at a later date. Too bad we missed this one. We were looking at those few other spots in town that had a mismatch between the zoning and the. <laughs> Uh, any questions for staff? Very well. I do. I have one Call question. Mr. Heiner. It might be a hypothetical, but how many other parcels out there are like this one? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully no more. We, we did a pretty extensive uh, look over on the general plan uh -huh. several times. And okay. This was one that uh, I think we... Went through. Well, I, I think they still had it in mind to do, at that time to do the uh, multifamily on the property. So this is a couple of years ago. And now things have changed. So we recognize that plans have changed over time. Very well. I uh, open to the public. If there's anybody who would like to comment on this specific item, the time is now yours. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. I move to uh, approve or forward any positive recommendation. Excuse me. I didn't try to have a horse there. I move that we, that we forward any positive recommendation to the City Council for the proposed land use map amendment for the 8.8 .8 acres of land at 7556 South Campus View Drive from very high density residential to regional commercial. Second. 
Motion by Commissioner Jacobs, second by Commissioner Heiner. Any discussion to the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 to 0. The last item on our agenda tonight, which is for Center Park Residential, was asked to be continued to our July 7, 2015 meeting, and we would need a motion for that. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Jacobs, second by Commissioner Quinn. Any discussion to that motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6 to 0. That concludes our agenda for the evening, unless there is anything else on your minds. So what I would like to see, do we need to initiate this, or do we need to, how do we do this, is how do we clean up, now that there's no conditional use condition on the Davis property, how do we clean up that RR1? Do we propose the text amendment to staff? How do we do that? Well, it's our intention to go ahead and do the cleanup of the code. Okay, so you'll take care of that? Okay. And then, all right, that works for me. I just want to make sure we don't leave that hanging so that we have that again the next time we do this. I move that we adjourn. Any opposed to that? We stand adjourned until July 7, 2015. Thank you, everybody.